So in this video, I'm going to talk about requirements for validation and verification. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is who should be reviewing the requirements by the time you're done with them. Uh, the first set of people have to do with where the requirements come from, the source of requirements. These are like the user representatives and like uh, sub subject matter experts. The other set of people that you have to think about are actually the victim of the requirements. Those are developers, testers, project managers, and technical writers. Those are persons who are downstream in the life cycle um, and will become involved and will have to take that requirement document and actually try to implement something out of it. The next set of persons are the representatives of related products. So this may be technical leads and engineers. What I mean by related products is not only, um, say, a competitor's product, but in the ecosystem of your of the of the software that you are building perhaps there are other subsystems that your device is going to interact with um, sometimes it may be a competitor's product or it might be uh, some interface through which your system gets data or something like that and those kinds of things should have a, a voice in when you're creating your requirements um, and the last set of things you should Review the requirements are the requirements analysts themselves, the persons who actually made requirements in the first place. Uh, those are the contributors and the managers of that process. So now you have to go on in the requirements process of what makes a review of the requirements effective, which is what we're actually trying to do. The first thing is you need to include the right reviewers. So whoever you're going to um, include, you have to make sure to train them and tell them what you expect of, of from them. Um, how is this review going to take place? Um, the next very important thing you need to do is not, 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 not to wait until you think you're done. If you're going to wait and think you're done um, with, it, with your requirements document, one's probably going to be very large and uh, it'll be difficult for everyone to go through that document. And then in reality, you will have to revise it anyways. What you should do is have incremental reviews early and you want to keep doing those reviews no matter how, whatever state the document is in you want to review it requirement by requirement you can't review the whole document as a whole each requirement has to be reviewed independently and then you want to improve <coughs> requirements that have been reviewed based on the feedback that you've gotten the next thing you got to make sure of that each of your reviewers don't go too fast if you try to go too fast um, you're going to probably end up shortcutting the process. Uh, as a rule of thumb, most persons go through say three to five pages per hour, um, and that's kind of a rough guideline in industry. Um, what some people also do is collect uh, their own rate, like how fast you are able to review a particular requirement, versus how effective you have been, like the amount of feedback that you're able to give for any one requirement. And then the last thing you want to be able to do is use effective preparation techniques. So one technique is that you can have each reviewer use different parts of the checklist or a different analysis technique. The next thing you can do is have reviewers start at different parts of the spec. So a lot of times when people start to read something, they have a lot of upfront um, they pay a lot of upfront attention to what they're reading and then as their concentration starts to dip you know they don't they don't pay as much attention so by starting people reading from different pages in between um, you're able to get probably a better um, you, you get fresh eyes on each part of the spec so when you're doing a validation of requirements here's here are 10 characteristics you want to look for um, during your validation reviews the first one is that the, each requirement is complete, so it's there's nothing missing in the statement of the requirement. Um, sometimes people put in like a to be determined in the middle of the statement, especially when they realize that they haven't fleshed it out enough. That's okay, but we want to be able to say that we have completed each one. The next thing you have to make sure that each requirement is consistent and that means that it doesn't conflict with another one in the list of requirements. <coughs> another thing to be looking for is um, the correctness of the requirement. That is, that it accurately states um, a user or an external need in, in that requirement. 
the next thing a requirement has to be is feasible. It can be implemented within known constraints. Um, a requirement, we need to be able to build a time machine, probably isn't that good a requirement. Um, a requirement has to be modifiable. So it can be easily changed with history when necessary. What I mean by this is that you're going to probably have a change management system. That is, uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of people who are changing document. You have to have rules as to who could change it and when they can change it. Those rules are not meant to um, impede progress of changing it. What they are meant to do is bring some kind of structure to it. And you want to allow that each requirement is able to be modified and you want to be able to capture things like who modified it, when did they modify it, why did they modify it, things like that. Um, the next characteristic of a very good requirement is that it has to be necessary. I document something the users really need. You don't want to fall into the trap of what is known as either user goal plating or customer goal plating and developer goal plating. It just has to do with where the goal plating comes from. Goal plating is when you're adding in um, extra things based on your likes or your like to have that kind of obscures the main thing that you should be building. The next thing that you want to do is make sure that the requirements are prioritized. So you want to rank them as to the importance of inclusion in the product. So um, every requirement can't be high priority. That's, that's not possible. You want to be able to use your prioritization scheme such that you want to build the high priority things first such that if at the end of the process you didn't have a chance to go through all requirements if you had just had the time to go through the high priority requirements only you, you you'd be willing to live with that particular product at any point in time the next very important thing that you need to be able to do is have traceable requirements that means that the um the functional and non-functional requirements in your SRS can be linked to a specific requirement in the user requirements document. It can be linked to a design decision you made in the um, architecture document, to a detailed design decision in a detailed architecture document, to specific test cases in unit, do unit testing documents and other test planning documents and that kind of thing. Um, usually the fundamental thing with traceability is that you need to have it numbered. Um, in a unique numbered list. I'll get to traceability in a separate video when I'm dealing with requirements management. The next characteristic of a great requirement is that it's unambiguous. So there's only one possible meaning to any reader, no matter who's reading it. The last and tenth uh, characteristic of a great requirement is that it's verifiable or that means it's testable. If a requirement is testable, it means we know how to test it and if we demonstrate that test, we're done. That, that's the characteristic of a really great um, requirement. <coughs> so once you do any kind of testing, inspection, analysis, or you can demonstrate it, then that's a great requirement. That's a great functional requirement or non-functional non requirement. So this is requirements validation and verification. Now, Requirements verification is usually about matching the functional and non-functional requirements that are in your SRS to specific user and domain requirements in your URS or requirements definition document. Once you're able to show that each requirement came out of a specific, each functional and non-functional requirement in the SRS came out of a specific user or domain requirement that's in your URS, then you know you need to have that there. Um, the other part of requirements verification has to do with uh, model checks. You, you, when you create your models, you could check those models for proof of completeness. I'm not going to go into that, this in this course. That's actually a topic all on its own. Um, two things that kind of pop out of requirements verification is that sometimes you need to scrub your requirements. If you have a requirement that's too complex or can't be shown to um, be related to actual user need captured in the URS, then you got to get rid of it. And that process is known as requirement scrubbing. The other thing you need to be able to do coming out of it is prioritize the requirements again. Um, a lot of times this could also, this process could help lead to minimal type specification. 
and that's about it for validation and verification of requirements thanks for listening bye